don't understand the science. Um, end of the editorial. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Luis Rocha. Before I introduce him, uh, know that he's Portuguese, so he, he deserves a round of applause just for that. Come on, with conviction, right? You guys have no idea how hard it is to become a scientist being Portuguese. Yes. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> um, so uh, Andy reminded me that I need to make a few announcements for the people um, with us on Zoom. The first one is that if you have questions, you can pu put them in the Q&A and someone will probably, Andy will kind of um, ask them uh, in, in person here. Um, the other thing that is very important is to know that we have one more seminar next week, I think. And in case you are, have been on Zoom and are not aware of that, we now have sandwiches to go at the end of the talk. And they are yummy. So, you know, you have been missing out. And we did it on purpose. So we could tell you, you have missed out. <laughs> Anyway, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have Luis here. He has all the right pedigrees related to um, uh, complex systems. I will not mention everything, just that he was in the Los Alamos National Laboratory group on complexity, and he actually created the other one group there. He was also involved with Santa Fe. He was um, for some time at Indiana University that we both love and hate because, you know, they are competitors, but then they are also interested in complex systems. So we forgive. The, um, and he does all sorts of cool research, and he also has very, very deep and thoughtful ideas about complexity. And I don't know if he's going to tell us something about that or not. There is always time for Happy philosophy in that, these yeah. things, right? <laughs> so um, please uh, join me in welcoming Luis and uh, looking forward to a great talk. Thank you very much. I, I guess I'll talk to this. Yeah, when I come here, I get reminded that um, uh, in Portugal, every, every person my age and his age are, are called Luis, if you, if you figure out, right? So that's, that's just a law, right? So that, Anyway, so um, let me start by uh, thanking the people in my group before I, I go. These are the people who are currently in my lab. As Luis said, I just moved from Indiana to State University of New York. So I'm still officially in Indiana. A lot of the students are still there. I um, also want to thank um, those that uh, contribute to this work, but who have left the lab in the meantime, particularly these guys. Uh, um, Santosh, Manuel, Alex, and Tiago. The talk is going to be centered on these two papers, but they will, I will show a lot more other things that go connected. But if you want to read more about the, the main concepts, it's these two papers uh, where, where they, they, they are talked about. And of course, think the sponsors of this research. Um, I should say like this as an aside, because since I moved from Indiana, uh, where I directed the, uh, that's still going on, the, an NSF NRT project on complex systems. I still have an affiliation there with this guy here, Johan Bolin. Uh, we still, we used to have a center for social and biomedical complexity there, and now we have a consortium for social <laughs> and biomedical because it, it, we are bridging it between the two universes and we want to get extra partners to help us grow this area. So anyone who's interested in collaborating with us, please uh, talk about, we're still very interested in this area and we want to make it work um, at a distance. All right, so con uh, going where I'm going to talk, by the way, interrupt me anytime uh, with questions. Um, I'll be happy to, to talk So um, and, and be interrupted. You can ask me about house music. You know, I'm, I'm a DJ, <laughs> so, but you live in Chicago, so I don't need to, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that for the evening. Um, so I, I think in this crowd, there is not, uh, um, uh, you know, I shouldn't, I don't need to emphasize why networks have been important given unprecedented uh, uh, access to data. A lot of people have focused on social networks. We do to an extent. I tend to focus more on biomedical networks. Uh, I'll get to talk about this one here, for instance, is um, involved in, in, in breast cancer. And it was the group of Rick Albert that, that uh, pr produced it. So we get to analyze it. But one of the things that I want to focus on is that 
uh, even though network science has been very good at capturing the organization of complex systems, of complex networks, there's been a move to try to control it, to understand what is the drivers, what are the causal drivers of, of, of complexity in these systems. And that's one of the things we focus on. In particular, this has been a question, uh, one of the more philosophical and grounding of, of the talk aspects of this that has permeated complexity for a long time. Um, uh, which is how can we have these systems that connect thousands and thousands of variables and how can they even exist? How they, with this hyperconnectivity, how are they not chaotic, right? We know, for instance, simple systems like Stu Kaufman has done this since um, the 60s and 70s that show that if you have dynamical systems that have more than average of two links uh, that you, they tend to be chaotic. And of course, there's a lot more to this story and I'll tell you a little bit more of this story later on. So how come systems like humans that have at least 30,000 genes and many more, we are not chaotic, how do we work? How does this stuff work? Um, and that's one of the questions I've, I've been focusing on. This actually is a question that concerned Waddington um, in, in theoretical biology and or in fact, Stu Kaufman's work is the direct sort of uh, answer to his idea of epigenetic landscapes in which he observed that organisms, even though they have many variables, many genes underneath, underneath that control them uh, and, and other types of variables, they tend to be too robust, robust to per, uh, perturbations. They talk, uh, he, he called it canalization or this idea that even though you can perturb the systems, they tend to converge into these valleys and be kind of stable and perturbations to them, just take them back to the developmental pathways. So this idea of the epigenetic landscape from Waddington has permeated a lot of thinking and complexity. Uh, but we still haven't quite solved how, how this canalization works, right? How, what are the mechanisms from, for which this works? So on the toolbox of, of uh, people in complex systems, we usually in complex networks, we deal with a number of things. We, some of us focus on patterns of connectivity or we usually talk about structure. Some people talk on patterns of dynamics. We all do a little bit of both. My group tends to focus on what I call patterns of redundancy, which is also another aspect that has been from the beginning in complexity, but sometimes we don't look at. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm going to look how these things work and how redundancy in complex systems actually helps uh, um, uh, us to, to not be chaotic or be near. Um, uh, in, in livable sort of configurations. Of course, uh, um, we already know that the structure plays a role. There's many, a lot of work in network science in heterogeneous and hierarchical clusters. I have an image here from one of the Luis's papers. To show, we know that the, if, if, if systems are very heterogeneous and hierarchical and modular, this facilitates this type of uh, stability, this type of robustness, right? even, or, or, or in some people, uh, want to be in the critical regime and we can get to talk about a little bit about that. Um, but other people uh, in particular, I, I particularly like the work of this system scientist and the theoretical biologist, Michael Conrad from the seventies and eighties. And he, he looked at the mathematics of very large multivariate systems. And he came up with something that is quite known in sort of theoretical biology, in particular in the theory of evolvability, he has, has a, whole, a whole book on evolvability. Um, and he observed that the higher the dimension of the spaces, the more high dimensional they are, the easiest it is to find a pathway that goes from one point to another. All right, so which is kind of countersensical, like right? the more dimensions you have, the easier is it, it is to find a pathway. And it, this is called the extra dimensional bypass. And one of the mechanisms at play for this that he highlighted was redundancy. And I, I mean, so what I'm going to show you next, next is sort of inspired by this view of these extra dimensional bypasses and how redundancy plays a role in this. So I'm gonna be a little more concrete and all this is just to see the grounding of where I'm coming from. So I'm gonna start talking about redundancy in network structure. And then uh, if we have time, I'll talk about redundancy in dynamics. So the first idea we have requires a little bit of a very simple math background on this. So what I'm gonna talk about has to do with weighted graphs. And this only applies to weighted graphs. The graphs have to have um, you know, it can be a proximity between zero and one or similarity, but we cast this as a distance. So a value between zero and infinity, which, which has an isomorphism to the other one. Uh, and in fact, we talk about in this 2015 paper, the isomorphism between the two spaces. 
So in these in these graphs, uh, there uh, we typically uh, think they obey the triangle inequality, uh, which is a, 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 big, a big foundation of sort of topological Euclidean spaces, which is the distance between two nodes. Uh, direct the direct distance between say x and y can never be larger than the distance any indirect distance that go through another node right so this is what it would mean for a system to be metric for a system to have to obey the triangle inequality by the way in, in what follows i'm going to use this square here to to sort of represent the adjacency matrix of a, a graph like this uh, um, which we also describe by d uh, so in these spaces, then uh, what what we happen, what we see that it observed as in, in in real in the real world when you ob obtain these networks from data, you observe that a lot of uh, many of the edges actually break the triangle inequality. You have spaces uh, edges in which an indirect distance via a, a third node is shorter than a direct distance, and so you can see the way this happens is, and that's what I'm going to talk about, is those edges that obey the triangle inequality are actually in a lower dimensional space that is defined by this metric that you do here by the triangle inequality itself. And those that do not obey live in a higher dimensional space outside of it. So you can think of these as kind of bypasses, indirect bypasses that connect these via a lower dimensional space. Um, okay, so we call these edges that break the triangle inequality semi-metric edges, and I started working about this in the late 90s, but uh, um, semi-metric is, is a topology that does not obey the triangle inequality, but obeys everything else that a distance is supposed to be. Um, so the triangular ed edges then obey the triangle inequality, and this can be generalized. Uh, it doesn't, the, here we are computing length as a summation. But length can be computed in many other ways, like by I, I put a function here, g. So this generalizes to any other type of distance, not just the summation. Um, so, and in this case, we refer to these as triangular edges, and these as semi-triangular edges for any kind of g. And I'll tell you some other g's later. I'm going to focus now on the metric one, which is this uh, when we use the summation. All right. Uh, so let, let's get a little more concrete and look at, at uh, particular examples. This is a famous network of airports in the United States from this paper. Um, and basically an edge here is, represents a distance um, that is proportional to the number of available seats between all the airline, all the flight, direct flights that happen between two cities, right? So if you have many seats between two cities, there's a shorter distance. That's basically how it is. And so if we look at the adjacency matrix of this, of this graph, one thing we can do to it is compute what we call the distance closure, which is an isomorphic to a transitive closure. For those of you in computer science very familiar with, with doing transitive closures. Um, and so if I, this is the, computing the, 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 the distance closure is the equivalent of computing every shortest path on the network. So basically you can use your Dijkstra algorithm and compute every single shortest path on the network. Uh, and this in computer science is usually referred as the all pair shortest path problem or, or APSP. Um, so if you compute all shortest paths, what you're basically doing is a transitive closure of this matrix into another one in which now every edge is guaranteed to have the shortest possible distance, right? Whereas here you could have some semi-metric edges, here you no longer have semi-metric edges. Everything is now the shortest possible distance. So one of the things is that we observe is that there is an invariant subgraph here that we call the metric backbone in the, when, the sum, when we use the summation and we call the distance backbone when it's any length measure of length, not just a summation. And this, this, this subgraph is sufficient to compute this. In other words, if you apply the same distance closure, the same transitive closure that you apply to this graph, subgraph that you applied to the original graph, you got the exactly the exact same uh, uh, closure, which means that it does not change your distribution of shortest paths. More thinking in, th in physics terms, it will not change at all your distribution of shortest paths. And it turns out, so when we compute it on this, it's a much smaller, and in fact, it's only 16% of the edges on the network which means that you only need 16% of the edges on the network to compute every single shortest path on that network. And by that definition, then 84 
percent are redundant or are semi-metric from the point of view of shortest paths. Doesn't mean that they are not doing other things on the network, but from the point of view of shortest paths, you do not need them uh, to compute every shortest path on the network, right? So from this, a, a very simple measure derives that we call the semi-metric distortion that applies to every edge. So basically this is just the original distance between the nodes versus the shortest distance uh, uh, divided by the shortest distance. Right? So if, in, if the edges are metric to begin with and they are in the backbone, this value is one because they, have no, they, have, they already exist in that lower dimensional space. But if it's greater than one, they're not in the backbone. And these are the semi-metric and they vary. They're, they can vary by a lot. Um, they can be very near one, but they can also be very large as we will see. So from this, of course, we derive very easily the proportion of metric edges, which is the relative size of the backbone. And uh, you could call the redundancy for shortest paths is this other parameter, sigma, okay? So this is basically what we're going to show next for, for a number of problems. Uh, let me first show an example. This is a, a simple example, uh, a toy example of this, this graph. These are distance weights. If we apply the metric backbone to this, this is the shortest distances that you get, right? If you do the distance closure, now here every edge has the possible shortest distance that, that it would have on the original graph. And so you can see that this edge breaks the triangle inequality because it used to be nine, but there's a shortest distance of eight. This one breaks even more the, the triangle inequality. So it's two, it's shortest path. So it broke a lot more. And this one does not break the, the triangle inequality. So it's in the, the direct distance is nine and the shortest indirect distance would be 10. So that would stay in the backbone. When you do this, this is the backbone of that network, right? Uh, and as you can see here, it's completely sufficient to compute every single shortest path that you exist in there. Um, and uh, given those parameters that I showed you, we can see that this edge over here has a semi-metric distortion of just 1.1, but this edge over here has a semi-metric distortion of 4.5. It breaks the triangle inequality 4.5 times, 4 .5 times uh, uh, if you want to think it that, that way, okay? This is the backbone. Uh, interestingly, Compare this to thresholding. Usually people simplify networks to thresholding, with thresholding, right? If I was going to threshold, even if I threshold it at nine, I would lose this lower edge and therefore changing the distribution of shortest paths because now the direct distance, the direct, the distance here would be 10. So even the, the least aggressive threshold on this network would destroy the short, uh, would affect the shortest path distribution, which the backbone doesn't. And if you go further, of course, you make it disconnected. Another feature of the backbone is preserved all connectivity, right? If it preserves all shortest paths, it preserves all, all connectivity. Uh, the minimum spanning tree becomes this one, which also connects, uh, also breaks all the shortest paths. And it actually maps to the ultrametric backbone, but I, I, I don't have much time to talk about this here, but you can see that in the paper, um, uh, this, this recent paper. Um, all right, so this is just to give you a toy example. So let's go back to the original network and I'm going to summarize what are the advantages and the ideas be behind this. So this, this provides us a principal network reduction method just for weighted graphs. So there's no parameters. There's no, no model estimation like many famous, uh, very good uh, backbone measures. It preserves all connectivity and shortest path distribution. And by the way, on this paper here was to present one backbone that is based on a null model. And our backbone is smaller than that backbone and preserves the shortest path, all the shortest paths, right? So, and that's discussed in this paper. Um, uh, it allows us to infer shortest path robustness, right? So a network with a very small backbone is robust to random node removal. Uh, obviously. Uh, a back, uh, also, the backbone is more robust if it's itself transitive with many low semi-metric distortion edges. In other words, if I remove a, a, an edge from the backbone, how easy it is to find a substitute edge that breaks the triangle inequality also very little. That comes from actually distribution of the semi-metric edges. So one of the nice things about that parameter, the S parameter, the distribution, is that even though every edge not on the backbone has no edge between the centrality, 
it actually has a huge variation in that parameter, in this, uh, that S parameter, meaning that most edges actually break the triangle inequality very little, but a few break it a lot. Some break really the triangle inequality a lot. So the more edges you have around here, the more uh, robust to perturbation is the backbone, right? If they're close to one, that means that on average, if I remove one from the backbone, I'll find another one that doesn't break the diagonal inequality much. But if you have a lot of them here, then the network is susceptible to, 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 to perturbation. So this parameter, the semi-metric distortion allows us to characterize shortest paths a little much better in more detail than say edge betweenness or something like that. So that's one of the arguments of this. Um, of course, the semi-metric edges We'll do other things. They participate in clustering. I'm not saying to throw away the edges. In fact, I'm just saying, I mean, if you are only interested in shortest paths, yes, throw them away because they do not contribute to your shortest paths. And so many algorithms in network science are based on shortest paths. Um, but if you want other things, you maintain it. And in our approach, actually, we study them. We study the semiatric metrics to, to understand the robustness in these systems. Um, uh, it's in, so it preserves all connectivity and all bridges are by definition in the metric backbone. So as I said, this generalizes, right? So instead of summation, if I use any length measure G here, I can compute other types of shortest paths and the, and the technique is exactly the same. So for instance, the ultrametric instead of the summation would be a max operation and basically you're doing min max composition, which is very common in probabilistic spaces. Metric is the one I showed, but you could do Euclidean, you can do Minkowski, you can do product, uh, you can do hyperbolic log normalized, you can have a backbone based on all those distances, right? Uh, so this is the family of shortest paths distances. This applies to everything that is a shortest path. So I showed you the metric, the ultrametric is the limit, it's the smallest back mode you can have, and there's a theorem for that. Um, and, and so in this class. In future work, and we're already looking at this, we want to generalize not just the length, but this other operation here that for all the blue ones is maintained constant, which is the minimum. If you generalize it to something else, then you have sort of like diffusion distances because then you're considering every shortest path. There's no guarantee that there is a backbone for that. There's other, there will have to be a parameters to define. Uh, and so we are working on that if you guys are interested. But in the meantime, uh, let me show you some examples. We apply this to brain networks. This is a, a connectome network. So obtained by the fusion spectrum imaging human brain. And you can see the backbone here is 18% of the network of the edges. So in, from the point of view of shortest paths and integration of information on this network, uh, you only need 18% of the edges. Um, the ultrametric backbone is only 6%, so it's smaller. Um, and this is an interesting thing that it makes it very robust. The metric backbone is itself robust because the ultrametric backbone actually uh, uh, is very small. So you don't usually by random affect just uh, uh, those that contribute the most. Yeah. Are these results for sort of uh, an average brain or so? Yeah, I, I, I actually, this Olaf Sporns gave me this one. I think this is an average brain. I, the one I show you next is for individual patients. Uh, I think this is for an average brain. It's an older data set. This is like the original paper where they in introduced the name connectome. So it's already a little old too. So we just showed it, we did it to sort of uh, see how it comes because there's some, some variation in this. Um, so we also see of the shortest path, this, the, the the, the, the semi-metric distortion varies uh, a few scales, but not as much as the airport one. So this is very robust, meaning that if I remove something from the backbone, I can easily find something with another that will not disturb very much the shortest path distribution on this network you know, in comparison to the airport network that we have here. Another interesting thing, which was a check, that's an, another reason I show this slide, because a check on our theory, 
So here we compare the distances you obtain from diffusion spectrum imaging that basically are considering the distance, you know, gross mode on how many fibers are there between points of, of contact. So instead of airport seats on the other network, we are seeing how many fibers, that's what contributes the distances. But we can look at the actual physical distance of these points in space. And so since that is constrained to a physical, Three, albeit three-dimensional, not two-dimensional, it will more likely be metric. And indeed, most of the edges are very close to one. So they have hardly any semi-metric distortion. The distortion you see here is, ex is explained by just the fact that we put a three-dimensional network onto a two-dimensional space. So most of the, so when we apply it to those physical distances, of course, everything is metric in that space. Basically, that, that, that's one of the things that that shows. Um, we, I'm going to bypass this. this is the same network at a different level of resolution. There's some neuroscience interesting things about it where, where this, the ultrametric backbone is uh, that we described in the paper. It makes perfect sense. It's between the hemispheres and the histola. So that, that's where you would expect those to be most important for aggregation of information. Um, in a more, we're writing a paper with Olaf Sporns at Indiana in which we looked at other data sets. And these are individual connectome data. We have two data sets. Uh, this one we don't have age of patient for. So, but we could find that uh, the metric backbone is on average around 11% um, of all pay. This is the distribution of the size of the metric backbone. This other data set, we have their age and we can see it's the same. It gets to the same values but uh, we see that there's a decrease in the size of the backbone in the first few decades of life. Um, uh, and, and so we're writing about that now. So this is 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years, and then there's sort of a stability. Of course, there's a lot of uncertainty here. We're also looking at gender. We have gender for this data set. Um, so we're looking at that, but basically the backbone is around 11%, but it starts at 13% for earlier ages or, 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 or around that. So, uh, yeah, and that's something we're looking at. I think one more, oh, you had a question. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'm thinking in terms of um, variation within different, the backbones of different individuals, mm -hmm. not only about uh, are some parts more uh, dense in some individuals than in others, could, could these, um, do you have kind of performance on any kind of um, cognitive skills for the individuals that actually potentially could be correlated with yeah. uh, the structure of the of the um, the backbone. Yeah, some I show you. There's one some that I'll show you next from somebody else who did that. Uh, um, not in this data set. We don't have any thing markers of for this data set. We are working with Olaf for that. Um, and, and trying to find out, uh, this is sort of preliminary to chart here. I mean, there's many details to this, for instance, how do you normalize these data and all of that to make sure the, back, the backbones depend on which distance you're using. I'm just using the metric backbone. So this is kind of a preliminary work, um, but more is coming. I think from this preliminary work that already allows us to do, there's an in interesting insight, which is this one. They use this measure of cost which is how basically how much the brain is involved is investing in terms of fibers in those uh, the, in those um, in those edges uh, between points of interest and even though the backbone is 11% it explains almost 50% of the cost of the entire network in other words the brain is investing on the edges that form the backbone much more than a random graph of the same size so this makes it look like it's a, an important feature that shortest path integration of information in the brain is potential. It seems to be, because we don't know, it could be the fusion of information. Maybe shortest paths have nothing to do with how information is. So this seems to imply that it is uh, um, because a lot of, uh, it's investing a lot of, of fibers in the backbone. Yeah. Maybe I missed uh, a little bit about how this network was constructed, but you said with the metric uh, shortest paths, you're you're looking at connections between different regions of the brain, but are those connections being mapped by the imaging here? Like, are they seeing physical fibers? And so if it's not a shortest path connection, does that mean the fibers are literally curved? I, I guess I'm not understanding how you get something that is not a shortest oh, path, but is a connection. That's a good question. So the, 
it, it is sort of the, the, the distance we are using for our edges is proportional to the number of fibers that there exist in the brain. To an, to, so the, okay, so, so you're imaging the fibers. That's we're imaging the fibers. So it's... Uh, uh, it's the inverse, yes. Yeah. So the inverse, of course. Sorry, yes. I mean, it's we're always in this space where we're dealing with the proximity space versus the distance space, which is an isomorphic, but it's proportional to that. Okay, yeah. And then we also see that it reduces in age a little bit, and this is preliminary work that we are looking at. Um, so the, the metric backbone then, uh, uh, I, this is converted there, but it's just that it reveals that the, 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 pref the pre preferable sort of uh, paths for, for shortest path integration, and it looks like the brain is investing some cost into it, uh, more than a random graph of the same size. Um, that, so uh, in a previous collaboration with a previous student of mine, uh, when he went, went to do a, 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 a postdoc at Cambridge, they did this to, I mean, in order to uh, early on to discriminate Alzheimer's and autism patients from healthy subjects. And they found that the characteristics of the backbones were um, good at discriminating. That it's in this paper. There's a couple of papers. This is where I brought the, the points for, and I can point that to you uh, if you want. Uh, I mean, so I'm not a neuroscientist, so but I know that people have been interesting there and um, in, 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 in looking at this, and we want to look at this more. We are currently co collaborating also with Liana Apostolova at the medical school in Indianapolis. But it's not it's networks involving the brain, but gene regulatory networks. So you're looking at the backbones of, gene, of those gene regulatory networks, which has nothing to do with, with connectome. Um, we also apply this to social networks. Uh, this is a collaboration that is under review right now, but it's in the bioarchive if you want to look at this. So Alan Bahat and others like Chiro Katutu have done these network, social networks in which they, they measure proximity of people with these RFID tags, right? You go like here and see who is near one another. And there's a number of networks that they've built in different contexts for epidemiological models, primary school to museums and so forth. Um, here, I'll show you a French high school. This is the original network and this is the backbone of that original network. Um, you can see that uh, the semimetric distortion has a, a huge variation, so uh, it's very semimetric. The backbone is about 10% uh, between 10 and 11%. That's the backbone, the metric backbone of this network. But there's a few other interesting features of, of this. Uh, before that, I want to show another check on our approach is when you look at the network they obtain in a museum exhibit, so they use the same technique in a museum exhibit where people mostly go alone or in pairs of two. And you see that the semi-metric distortion is very low. Uh, it means that the whole network is pretty much its backbone uh, uh, because it's more like a random network, right? So this is kind of a check in what, what you were thinking. Whereas in these, there's a definite social structure. Um, in the museum, there isn't. Uh, and so indeed the backbone preserves the social structure. That's what uh, the, a big part of this article is this point three is to find, we looked into many of them. I'm going to fast through here, but when you look at like say the Luva mod modularity on the original network versus the backbone, you can see that it does break into smaller components in a hierarchical fashion, but most of them remain within the same class groups. The colors represent class groups there. Um, and so forth. So when you do a threshold, you break it much more. Um, and when you do a random graph of the exact same edges, you break it, of course, even more. Uh, so that's one of the things we did for all these networks. Uh, perhaps more importantly, we looked at uh, uh, epidemic transmission. In this case, we just look at a very simple SI model uh, in which we look at the time to half and full infection of the network, assuming one node gets infected, how long it takes to infect the whole network or half the network. Here in yellow, I'm highlighting the time to full network. So over here, we have the original network with all its edges. And then we remove edges until we get to the backbone here. right? So we remove edges and then we see what is the time. And the red line is the backbone. The blue line is a threshold network of the same number of edges as the backbone. And you can see the time to transmission increases a lot and random graphs of the same time. And it gets worse uh, because at some point you cannot even compute it. The bars that you see are here because the network gets broken into pieces uh, with thresholds and with other, whereas with the backbone, it doesn't. So it looks like even in simple epidemic models, 
that the backbone is a preferred subgraph for transmission uh, dynamics, right? If you threshold it, you would obtain very different. So anything you do, and it's just not epidemic because we use a lot of transmission models. If you're gonna threshold your networks, you have to think twice before you do it because you're gonna affect uh, the shortest path distribution. So to finalize this part of the talk, I, I, we looked at a lot of networks uh, and all their backbones. It's all in that paper, for instance, C. elegans, uh, the nervous nerve network of, of, of C. elegans. Interestingly, you can see in, in, the, in the context of that con of cost, its backbone is almost 47% compared to the human brain that was 18%, right? So in this case, it looks like this organism is investing a lot more. The cost of these fibers are much more. Uh, so they need to exist. So the, both the backbone and the ultrametric backbone are quite large uh, for this network. They don't have much redundancy. Uh, they have a lot fewer neurons and all that. Whereas the human brain has a lot more redundancy, uh, which makes sense. If you want to see the network that has least redundancy is the network science scientists uh, from the physics archive. So this is a, a co-authorship network, which is basically like a star network. And the size of the backbone is 83, 84% and the back ultrametric back. And not only is it metric, it's ultrametric. So in other words, this network is almost as in its own backbone. And there's a, I, there's a reason for that. First of all, people investing in writing a paper is not that easy. Right, so you do, you only invest in a few a few, few times. So, from this metaphor that I've been sort of an intuition that I have about this about the cost, you would say there's a huge cost invested in writing these. So you would expect not to have a lot of redundancy. You don't write nilly willy papers, right? So it's like uh, hopefully you don't, right? Uh, and so this is this is the most uh, the the, the most uh, the least semi metric and the largest backbone we found. Um, the smallest one was this big, large uh, gene regulatory network that we've been working on. Uh, this is just summarizing the same things I said, what are the advantages of the backbones? I'm not going to summarize, but um, uh, 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 an interesting thing here that I wanted to sort of summarize with, the, uh, with, with, with what I said is that you can look as that most, most real world networks are very semi-metric. They have very large redundancy. So this means that most edges exist in a very high dimensional space that is outside this lower dimensional space where the backbone works. And so the backbone works as these bypasses, sort of like Conrad that I talked about was saying these bypasses that give you shortest paths in a lower dimensional space that whatever you project it to, uh, uh, the, the Euclidean space, the metric space, whatever you decide to do. So that's sort of the inside insight there. We have code for any network you want to do. There's a Python package here. If you're interested in applying the backbones or any back, not just the metric, ultra metric to your, to your networks, they have to be weighted graphs. Um, uh, please, please download our package. And now what I was talking earlier, I got a little ahead of myself. This is sort of very recent work. This is the shortest backbone we found, 1.75 in human genes uh, um, involved um, in uh, male infertility. We're looking in meiosis of spermatocytes, basically. That's a collaboration with Paul Navarro Costa at Gubinkin and also Rion Correa in our, uh, our, in our group. Uh, so um, basically in this network, just to show where we're going with this too, we convert it into a multi-level network. So our, we want to know what backbones mean, mean in multi-scale networks. So we have data uh, from Drosophila, mouse and human uh, involved in spermato spermatocyte production, uh, many, many genes. So we then map the layers via their orthologs. Uh, so evolutionarily conserved, they say more or less the same sequences. This is not an easy thing to do because sometimes it's a one too many meeting a, a gene might divide and, and, and so forth. But we found, I mean, this is, uh, if you want to know more of the details, it's on bioarchive that you can look at. Um, we basically computed the backbone on each one of these networks and then computed something Rion Correa calls the ortho backbone, which is the backbone of all the orthologs uh, on this network. Um, it's interestingly that even though it's, we call it the ortho backbone, it's not itself a metric backbone. It does not guarantee that you preserve all shortest paths. It's smaller than that. So in future work, we want one that guarantees that we have all shortest paths. Can I ask a clarification mm -hmm. question about the, the multi-level? So 
do you make a choice that it is one to one and never one to several? Uh, we made different choices. No, but we keep all of them. We just have uh, a uh, so sometimes these edges are not uh, unique, right? They they can go to two, like say, okay. a gene in human is two in in fly, uh, and vice versa. So we do keep those edges, right? And you are doing these based just on sequence similarity and not sort of kind of function or localization not, in the of the not real. I mean they're already or... in spermatocytes so all of this was ob obtained for I mean there's a pre-filtering of all, all all of those in uh, the revolutionary we looked at evolutionarily conserved uh, so that's a big part of the results of this paper is that to show most a lot more than you would expect of human uh, genes involved in spermatocyte production are evolutionarily conserved in all these species, uh, all the way to Drosophila. They share a lot. It's it's a it's a, it's a bit, very conserved signature. Um, uh, but so there's many nuances to this that we could talk. This this is a paper that has like 50 authors. So <laughs> like all biology, in the end we went back to human and we made experiments. Our we predicted some edge. We give the ortho backbone. We predicted genes that would be involved in male infertility. We we tested that, or our collaborators tested that in Drosophila, and then we went to human databases in Germany and Denmark. And we identified humans that have those genes. So we, this paper identifies a few new genes that were not previously known to be involved in male infertility. Um, and so that, that's under review now, but it's already in the bioarchive if, if you want to, and I can tell you some more details about it. Okay. So to find, I mean, just wanted to show a little bit about our, uh, if I can go quickly on the dynamic side of things, because I know some people are interested <laughs> on, on systems biology model. So what I showed you is, Per, per completely structural networks is a type of redundancy on shortest paths. We have another paper that is also inspired by the work of Waddington and Kaufman uh, and getting back into that canalization. I'm gonna go quickly through this to just show you the key idea. So you already know that structure affects some of these dynamics, particularly the work of Massimo Aldana and all of that, that uh, the, the, the Boolean networks that Kaufman came up with, um, they tend to be very chaotic but if you make them more heterogeneous, the link distribution, they can be a little off phase, but they're still very easily chaotic. And Kaufman himself started looking at these canalizing functions uh, to explain why uh, there's more stability in these networks. And we've, we've gone in, you know, following him and others uh, into look at redundancy here. And so uh, I'm gonna bypass, this is a, a nice graphic that we've done. But to do that, I, I have to give you a little overview of Boolean networks. Uh, I think many of you might be familiar with, but just a small overview of Boolean networks, because these are not graphs like I've been talking about. So these are graphs, they do have a graph structure, but they have node function. So at each function, can, each node can be in a state zero or one or true or false or however you want. In case of genes, we interpret them as expressed and unexpressed. Um, but they, they, so they have a, both a dynamics and a structure. So uh, many dynamical systems fit the same structure. So this very simple motif of three variables have 64 possible dynamical systems that fit it. And in this paper with uh, Alex Gates, we talked a lot about this. And, the, the problems this brings to a lot of controllability theories that are in vogue that only use the structure to predict the dynamics. It's when you're predicting, using only the structure to predict dynamics here, you're, you're using predicting the dynamics of an entire ensemble of dynamical systems that fit there. The same structure fits a huge ensemble. So even this one just has 64. This is one of the examples of its logic in which node two just copies node one and node three does a disjunction or the or of node one and two over there. This gives you a dynamics here represented by a state transition graph. These are the, the values of each of the three variables. Like here, you have val variable one in one on and the other two in off, and they converge to attractors and it's, it's a tra tractor landscape. So these are cool little systems that have been used in complex systems for a long time. They're sort of canonical complex systems that, that we can use. They allow us to study both structure and dynamics because they have both. Um, in systems biology, these have been used successfully to model systems chiefly because of the work of Rick Albert in making these sort of feasible for anal uh, analyzing actually 
systems biology models. This is her original, very famous model of Drosophila development. It's a gene regulatory network that, that models the patterning that you see in the development of, uh, uh, of the fruit fly. Um, you typically obtain these even from either from databases of the literature or you go into multi uh, time series, multi multivariate data, and you estimate the best network and dynamical system that fits there. So systems biologists do this. It's very undetermined problem. It's very hard to do it, but that's what people do. Uh, and interestingly, there's a, a large database that we will use called the Cell Collective put up by Thomas Helliker at Nebraska that collects a lot of the systems biology models, discrete dynamical systems that have been produced in the literature. Uh, and they have a number of them there that allows us to do tests uh, on, on these models. So to give you the gist of our idea of redundancy in dynamics, which is different from redundancy in structures, consider this little motif here. Um, which is, let's say, gene four is being regulated by three other genes, right? Has a in degree of three. That's its uh, K in degree of three. But then the node itself has a dynamics, a logical function, which is given by a lookup table that tells us, depending on the states of its inputs, what it will do at the next time step. So it will remain unexpressed as long as these patterns of the three inputs are, and it will only express if you have these pat patterns, if you consider it a gene. It turns out that there's a lot of redundancy in these lookup tables. And this is usually removed, uh, the one easy way to remove is what computer scientists have been doing from the 60s with these types of lookup tables. There's a very famous article, uh, algorithm called Quine-McCluskey algorithm that is used for circuit design. So you read, when you're making a, a circuit and you want to reduce it and remove the redundant parts, this logically computes the what's known in logic as the prime implicant. So just running this algorithm from the 60s, we, we use this symbol hashtag to represent a state that you don't need to know its state in order to converge that. So for instance here, you can see that gene four will be expressed as long as gene one and two are expressed and it doesn't matter what three does. In fact, it never matters what three does in this network. That's one of the things you recover, right? So this gives you the minimal set of control transitions. What this is doing is just the logical uh, end of X1 and X2 and ignoring the X3, right? So this allows us to compute a measure that we call in, input redundancy, which is basically, there's a formula for it here that you can see in this paper, but it's basically the mean number of hashtags that exist on the lookup table uh, uh, with some assumptions. And you can see then that input redundancy is on average 1.75. This allows us to compute this measure we call effective connectivity, which is the in degree, so three, minus the input redundancy that we obtain, which is the average number of hashtags. So we can see the effective connectivity of this node is actually 1.25. So what does this mean? Even though it receives three inputs, on average, it only needs 1.25 to turn its state to either on or off. Okay, that's, that's the, and this is not an estimation. This is a parameter. It's a probabilistic parameter of the function. So it's, it, it, uh, uh, that's an advantage of our approach and what makes it scalable because this is done at the, node, at the node level. So basically then now we compute what we call the effective graph, which is we resolve this uncertainty to the edge level, which we call edge effectiveness. And that's computing the mean number of hashtags, but only per column. Right, so when you compute it per column, then you can see there's zero there, and here 0 0.625, 0 0.625, and the sum of these adds to that one, right? So, uh, and the theory is tight in that way. Um, so basically what you can see is that you, when you have one of these networks originally, you have something we call the interaction graph. This is the original network, which is typically obtained as we saw from qualitative pairwise estimation, estimation of interaction. There's no dynamics represented in this graph. And as I say, many dynamics fit this same structure. So what we try to do is bring some of the dynamics into the graph. So basically we come up with a graph structure that integrates some of the dynamics information, namely the redundancy of the dynamics. And this is what we call the effective graph. For instance, in this case, this one is completely redundant and some are more effective than others, right? The edges are the effectiveness. So the way we look at this, is that it provides a causal explanation of how dynamical perturbations and cons control signals propagate in the network. 
right? So this is now a graph, but it has some dynamical information was obtained at the node level from the dynamic in information. And we could indeed, just in this toy model that I see here, do a very simple thing, which is compute the Spearman correlation of if we assume there's an epidemic spread model that shortest paths are important in this, um, that the effective graph is much more correlated with the real dynamics that, an, an, uh, that goes there than the interaction graph. If I use this graph to, us, to, to try to study how the dynamics propagate, it correlates much less with the real dynamics underneath it, right? And so then we go to the whole cell collective, to all the biological networks that exist on that database and see how does this work in the biological networks. First, in this paper, we looked at the node level and you can see that the original in degree of the models goes to well beyond 10, but effective connectivity never reaches three in every single node. So on average, every variable is never regulated by more than three inputs in those biological networks. Again, that magic number from Kaufman between two and three to not be chaotic right there. There's one way that the effective, uh, the effective connectivity is very different from the underlying connectivity. Um, and, and here is the effective connectivity uh, and here is the original connectivity. So you can see that it's really squished. <laughs> um, when we looked at the edge level, I'm just focus on this side here, we used all the cell collective autonoma against a null model of random lookup tables of the exact same parameters uh, in degree and bias, um, which is the probability of being on. And, and we can see that is a very a big difference. The biological networks are a lot more redundant, a, a, a lot less effective on average in the edges than a random graph of the same, of the same size. We also observed surprisingly that 21 models had completely redundant edges. There are edges on those models that do nothing on that network. They're completely redundant, right? Um, which is interesting because when you aggregate information and you put them in a network, then they suddenly cease to have any function there. Um, we also look, it's not just that they're less effective. We also looked at the heterogeneity with the Gini coefficient and look at the, the even not, not only do the edges have less effectivity, that effective, effectiveness is very heterogeneously distributed. So meaning that some edges are much more important at regulating than others, especially when you compare them to the random model. Um, in, in other words, a, a gene may receive like 10 inputs many of them will be completely not effective and only one or two of them is very important at, at controlling that gene, right? So that's the effective graph. And this allows us to have robustness to, to most perturbations. Um, just to finalize then, like look at this in real biological networks to see what this means. This is one of the models uh, of, uh, uh, of Taliana flower development, a small gene regulatory network. When we compute the effective graph, we see three edges are completely redundant. They do nothing on that network. And many of them have very, very low effectiveness, have very, very low effectiveness, okay? So uh, we also have a, a package for any discrete dynamical system that you have um, that we can apply this to, to, to compute the effective graph. Um, it produ produces these tables where you can see, for instance, agamus protein here receive, has an in degree of nine but only 2.1 are effective in, in controlling it, right? So even though, so imagine if you're going to apply structural controllability here, you're assuming this gene receives nine inputs when in reality it's only receiving 2.1 uh, given the dynamics. So uh, we can compute all of this. Um, and I'm going to bypass this to show you some uh, final examples of why this is important in telling us how the dynamics actually operate. This is not just a numerical thing. So if we go to the effective graph, and in this case, we thresholded it, um, we can now see that some genes really have very little effect on the network. Even though, like if you apply controllability, even the best controllability analysis, and this is small enough that I can actually compute the exact controllability of this network, it would tell them this whistle gene is, is necessary to control the network. But when you look at the effective graph, you actually see it's only needed to control, you'd only need to control that gene if you're interested in controlling it itself, right? It doesn't do any, it's completely dynamically decoupled from the rest of the network. 
So if you just use a numerical approach that tells you which need, genes you need to control, it will tell you all of these here are important to control. But in fact, they do nothing. Like these three don't do anything on the rest. Uh, only one is sufficient to control the whole network uh, because it has a pathway to all of this. And we show that in the paper um, that that leafy gene is sufficient to control everything else. So this tells systems biologists how control is actually operating, not just the, the ones that do control, not just the, the number of controls. And there's some nuances about this, uh, about how we show that leafy is not used to control that I'm bypassing, but you can see in the paper. Just to give a shout out, because I'm getting to the end and, con and, and link the two, because I didn't link to, in this, permanent, this, this recent work, we now thought about how do we link the backbone to the effective graph, right? Is there such a connection, right? So now that the effective graph is a weighted graph, we can uh, compute its backbone, right? And so this is the effective graph of this network. And then we compute its backbone, which this work shows two things that we hadn't shown earlier. The backbone is computable for directed graphs, not just undirected graphs. And interestingly, in this model, this is very preliminary, we only apply this to the Staliana model. There's no dynamical difference, that's the red line, between the effective graph and the backbone. The backbone does exactly the same dynamic prediction as the effective graph in this network. In other words, instead of thresholding as we were doing here, the better way to compute what is the subgraph that is completely sufficient to control is to apply the metric backbone of the effective graph. And it seems to preserve the most of the dynamics. And so uh, I'll finish this here. In the paper, we analyze a much larger network of breast cancer, but you're gonna to have to read the paper because I ran out of time. <laughs> we have a few minutes for a couple of questions. I know that people have to leave at one. So if you have to leave, feel free to, but um, as I said, we have time for a couple of questions. So uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I I had a question just about the whole the backbone idea, and you mentioned briefly earlier how the impact on modularity assessment. But I I guess, and I should maybe read. You've probably written about this, but maybe you could give me just a few words about that. I would think that reducing the network to its backbone would change, like community de community detection and and how you can assess number of communities. Um, but it's not clear to, it's not obvious to me how, but I suspect that it changes. So, yeah, it's a very good so, uh, question. So in the beginning, I thought that actually to destroy community structure, right? That's why I always said in, in, in the paper, we say this, the semi-metric edges that we remove from the backbone are doing potentially something, especially in community structure. This more recent paper with Alain Bahat that we looked at the social network showed that actually the backbone still preserves very much the social structure. It does remove some, it reduces them a little into a sort of hierarchical subgroups, uh, but, inside, but it preserves gross mode better than anything else. So in that paper, uh, so subgraphs of the same size are shown to, to, to destroy it. Um, and a reason for that might be because it has to preserve connectivity. So if it has to preserve all shortest paths, it will do so at various levels of the hierarchy, right? So it will have to preserve the shortest paths inside a, a small community as much as in the whole network. So it will tend to, pre, to, pre, to also uh, sustain of the, if, uh, the, 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 the social structure. That's my intuition. And we are sort of uh, uh, going on that direction to understand how modularity works. I have a question about the last part and the its potential use for curating this kind of databases. So um, there is this idea that as time goes by, some experimental condition will show that there is an interaction between any pair of genes that you choose, right? <laughs> yeah. So eventually this graph will become fully connected because you are saying, did this gene Somebody. change the other one, right? Yeah. But, it could be going through different places, right? So you are not finding direct uh, connections when you do those kinds of studies. And so one of the possibilities is that, you know, 
you want to find out what is directly connected. Yeah. And this could be a, a way to actually go and look at the these databases and see, well, from everything else that we know, this would not need to be no there. No need to be here. It's a and, 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 and it could be a way to kind of fight that tendency that everything eventually will be connected to everything else. Yeah like everything will have every single go annotation that you can think of. So have you guys looked into that? Yeah, we, we thought a lot about, I mean, so you're absolutely right. For instance, that big spermatocyte network that we got, how did we obtain it? We went to the string database that many computational biologists use that uh, you can extract edges that somebody in some paper, in some experimental database said that they related, right? You can dig, I mean, and we did to make sure we only had human and human experiments, not machine experiments. You could decide the tissue, you can decide, so you can filter them, but still many people are doing many experiments, right? So there are edges there that are not, so, uh, and those are not even dynamic. So I, I agree that this is a mechanism to, keep improving these networks. These Boolean networks that are in the cell collective, when we were submitting this to PNAS, one of the reviewers kept insisting on that, how come these models are there? What are biological reasons that you would have completely redundant edges or very low edges there? And so in the paper, we explore several possibilities. Uh, uh, some are really, you know, they exist in some dynamical system, but not that one that you are modeling, right? So the biologists put an edge there because somebody reported they exist, but maybe for that. And then there's network effects that have, so maybe pairwise experiments show that they knock out, but when you put them all together, they no longer doing, but you're not running multi-area experiments in the lab most of the time, right? So I know I'm happy that our approach, at least in some groups, for instance, Rick Albert told me that they do, they now are more aware of this. When they're building a network, they will do the Quine-McCluskey algorithm that we do to make sure they don't have something completely redundant before they put it on the cell collective, right? So it has a cross-check feature to it. So if it's only used for that, I'm happy. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So I think we are, time uh, let's thank Louise one last time and uh, thank you everybody and look forward to seeing you next week and don't forget there are sandwiches thank you